Good evening, everyone, ladies and gentlemen. The timestamp for calling to order our work briefing session is 6 0 Okay. Uh, just for information, we do have an executive session. And depending on how long it takes, we may start it, we may recess it, and we may go back. Hopefully, we can get it all finished while we're in our briefing session time. So it all depends on, on how that particular item goes. Okay. Um, <laughs> Those do not match your outfits, Mr. Harvey. I have a color. <laughs> Does anything match his outfit? Hey, you're a native, so whatever he does, I'm. <laughs> all right, all right. Let's uh, get underway. Because, uh, we anticipate a lot of people coming tonight for the seven o'clock, and also uh, I will be doing a. Uh, Another what do we got? Champion of the city. That guest will be here at seven. They don't tend for staying all night long, as most of them don't. So we like to uh, be able to honor them with, with uh, our, our being on time. So uh, item number one: discuss the agenda items. City manager, please. Thank you, Mayor and Council. Good evening. So today we have on our consent agenda item uh, 4A, consider the minutes for February 1st, 2022 uh, City Council regular meetings. This is the February 15th, 2022 City Council regular meeting and the February 21st special council meeting. Item 4B, consider a resolution to enter into a joint election agreement and election services contract between Dallas County and other jurisdictions holding elections on May 7th, 2022 to be administered by the Dallas County Election Administrator in accordance with Chapter D of Chapter 31 and Chapter 271 of the Texas Election Code. The agree oh, I'm sorry. Oh, finish it. Finish this agreement is with Dallas County and other jurisdictions to hold the elections as a joint election in accordance with the uh, chapter. Uh, the contract agreement provides for the Dallas County to perform and supervise any performance and corresponding with those duties. Yes, sir. So I did notice that this particular item had 129 pages. And I think just for information, if you go back in time, remember we discussed about how many different voting locations the county was designating for our city there are what 11 if i recall correctly. 11 in the city of Nuketal. 11 there are 11 voting places vote centers, vote centers uh, that have been designated by the county and the city of duncanville so that accounts for that eighteen thousand dollars and they, their response was if you recall maybe next year they're going to look at it and they'll reduce the number but this year it's going to be 11. so that's that's the cost of the eighteen thousand. All right, item 4C, consider a resolution appointing election judges for the city of Duncanville in the Dallas County for the May 7th, 2022 general election and authorizing the city secretary to approve on behalf of the city of Duncanville any changes in the list of recommended election judges, which may become necessary because of the inability to serve of any person uh, named in Exhibit A. The city secretary has submitted a list of early voting and election judges since the 26 May 2016 election and has the ability to modify the list as necessary. It is recommended that the council consider previous election judges who have served in these precincts. It is essential to choose someone who has handled large precinct combinations and ballot styles before. The city's polling locations are not the typical polling locations with one ballot. Given the multiple ballot styles for each precinct, it is imperative that each voter receive the correct one. And based on City Secretary's comments, the, the primary election judge, Barbara Barbara Lewis. Lewis. She is a longtime election judge for the city of Duncanville. She's good, she's strong, and she's been doing it as for a very, very long time. And Kristen has utmost faith in her ability to conduct the business correctly. So she would be uh, she's on this in terms of our election process for, for Barbara. Okay. 4D, consider a resolution authorizing approving for of a facade and paint incentive grant by the Duncanville Community and Economic Development Corporation to Sarah R. Mitchell of Mitchell Commercial Investment LCC in the amount of $14,800 for a building located at 1307 South Alexander Avenue, Duncanville, Texas. Mitchell Commercial Investment submitted an incentive of 
application on December 10th, 2021, requesting up to 157,000 in potential assistance for parking lot improvement, pavement improvement, facade stonework and exterior paint. By a vote of 4-2, the DCEDC board approved 14,000 in incentives, 9,800 for stonework facade and 5,000 for exterior paint. And it's regular meeting at the January 24th, 2022. The board did not approve the incentive funding for the parking lot repaint. The incentive agreement is included in your meeting packet along with any bids required by the DCEDC incentive policy. Yes, sir. This question is for Gus. Gus. Can you share with us uh, the rationale behind the two board members that voted against it? Yes, I can. So a couple of questions came up during the application process. One of them was uh, regarding the conformance with our plan and zoning, our codes uh, have to do with the concrete and bringing the building up to code. Part of the comprehensive plan and economic development centers, uh, one of the initiatives is to bring buildings up to code. Uh, I believe a couple of our board members felt that prior to submission for incentives, they would prefer that the applicant bring it up to code before applying. Uh, some of the other board members felt that uh, because of the process takes place, it's a reimbursement type incentive. Uh, it sort of takes care of itself. So once the grant is applied for and approved, the applicant goes through the process of code enforcement and plan zoning certificate of occupancy. At that point, it takes care of itself. So the remaining board members felt that it was appropriate to award the incentive. Uh, I'm excited about the opportunity after our conversation last night with the DADC to uh, vote in favor of this particular initiative. The paperwork provided was interesting. I mean, the pictures and all the estimates that were given to us, and it was just a good amount. Yeah. Uh, thankfully, that the owner is looking to improve that particular activity in terms of the structure. It, it, it's going to be a good move for us. Absolutely. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. Yes. Yes. Um, not, not exactly specific to this one, but I'm not getting outside of getting off, off track here. Be sure you're not. Do we, do we require that? The uh, contractor who's going to do the painting provides specifications about the type of paint they're going to use, in addition to whether or not that paint needs a primer. I saw uh, something about power washing, but what about the? Yeah, that that would not fall under EDC's purview. That would fall under the uh, code enforcement building inspection purview. So that wouldn't come to us as an as an economic development corporation. So is it? Does that make sense? Well, yes and no. Um, I'm not think I'm not I'm not sure they're equipped to assess how paint uh, you know application. Oh, so it's, I'm sorry. So what you're asking me is if we have requirements on the type of paint, the quality type, the quality of paint specifications. No, at the current moment, no. Okay, because that leaves us moment, that leaves us open to the possibility that even if it's a, a decently quali uh, quality paint, if if primer was required, as would only be known by a true painting contractor, then it could peel off prematurely. So it's just something, that, something I think we need to be able to watch out, the lookout for in the future. Okay. Is, is there any interaction uh, after the job is finished or substantially complete by our uh, regulatory people, inspection and what have you, to look and see if that work is up to our standards. Is, is there anything like that that takes place? Yeah, it, I mean, obviously, code enforcement goes through a series of inspections and green tags it to make sure that they, they get a certificate of occupancy. And all of those factors will be you know, checked and rechecked before the certificate of occupancy is issued. More so on the uh, brick type work. The paint is kind of a. Yeah, but the uh, building code doesn't address paint types. Right. There, there are some prohibited materials in the paint, like lead. But there's no coding requirement on the quality of the paint under the building code. And of course, now you know that the legislature has taken some of our abilities. Materials. Uh, not regulate that from the zoning standpoint, <clears throat> but they didn't say anything about the quality of a grant. So if we do grants and have a special quality of paint, 
that we'll reimburse for it, then the, we incentivize them to have the right name, to your point. But we don't have a policy adopted to do that. That may be something that the board and you would want to incentivize so it looks nice and stays looking nice. We that's could, one reason you do it. I've seen clauses like, you know, work in like manner or to use, you know, specifications that are of high quality, I mean, those kind of general statements, but specific to the type of paint. I mean, if there's something that's concerning to the council, certainly we could look into that and include that. One of the things we have to be careful about doing that is we may exclude materials and exclude contractors and then we get looked at as we're favoring one over the other. Yes, sir. So we have to be careful. We Thank are you. we are tangentially off subject. Uh, so if there's any more discussion on the part of city council members to talk about codes and quality and standards, we need to make that a different item for our agenda. Okay. It, it's a valid question. It has merit, but it's off topic in terms of being on agenda. Uh, so I want to make sure that we, we stay exactly where we need to be in terms of being a problem. Okay. That concludes the uh, consent items, sir. Okay. Uh, moving on to item number two, discuss the annual city calendar. Um, there is something important that I do need to mention that the city has been served with a petition. And in order to comply with all the administrative laws applied to the receiver, <coughs> we need to schedule a special meeting. And that special meeting has to be not later than Monday of the coming week. So it has been uh, scheduled by city secretary. This will be the consensus or agreement by all of us that that meeting would be March 7th at 6 p.m. Please check your calendars and see if it's, if you have any conflict, please try to de-conflict or uh, we recognize that we would have a quorum present in order to uh, present that information on the petition. And there's no further detail necessary to be provided to you other than it would be yeah, making sure that the, the petition uh, mm -hmm. by the city attorney has the has, has been filled correctly. What was the time? What time? March seventh at six p.m. I'm good. Good. Okay. All right. Good. Yes, sir. Six p.m. March seventh. What do we call that meeting? A special meeting. Special meeting. meeting uh, petition review. Yes. Validation. Okay. Very good. okay, City Secretary, what else do we have on the calendar? All right, so like we just said, March uh, 7th at 6 p.m., we will have our special meeting. We have a City Council meeting on March 15th, as usual. On March 17th is the flavor of Duncanville. Um, just to let y'all know, I am getting a booth this year and it will be for board and commission. So I will be accepting applications there. So y'all can stop by and Say hi. Um, the 24th of March, we're going to have the town hall on the budget education on budget process. And that will start at 6 p.m. And more than likely, it is at the senior center. Next slide, please. In April, we have on the 5th, our city council meeting. On the 9th, which is Saturday, is the police banquet. And when I get more information on that, I will send that to you. On the 13th, I have the Red Summit. Um, when I get more information, I will send that to y'all also. Okay, all these are not on the If you go back to March or on the, the 10th, it's, it's invitations for Mac Ryan for time. Yes, sir. Yes, March 10th, Mac Ryan. What's the time on that? Can we go back to the March? <clears throat> Did you say it was happening on March 21st? 24? 24th is going to be the town hall on the budget. Oh, the introduction to the budget process. Okay. 
Yes, yes sir. sir. April. I'll let me know when you're ready for April. What time? What time? At six p.m. That's on March. We got hard copy on March. Mm -hmm. I do thirty days out on the city council calendar for that. Okay. ready for me to go to April? Okay, for April on the 5th, we have our city council meeting. On Saturday, April 9th is going to be the police banquet. That's, that's also Operation Clean Up, you will. Okay. That's banquet. Looks like they're we're looking at a afternoon, early evening, two to six or something like that. Um, but we're they're still to yeah. The cleanup is like what ten to two or it's eight to one. Eight to one for the cleanup. Yes, sir. And when I get more information on the banquet, um, I will provide that to y'all. Okay. I also have on the calendar on Wednesday, April 13th, Red Summit. Um, I do not have any more information on that. When I get that, I will provide that to y'all. That is not free to us. Correct. That's a, ticket, that's a ticketed event. Was it 50 bucks ahead? I believe so. Yeah. Are we buying a table, a table for it? We usually buy a table for city council. So when I get the information, I'll just reply back to me and I'll let y'all know. If you would make sure uh, we do it early enough because I think there's a red box or something that comes with it. Okay. Uh, that was, that's an there. individual registration. That's out there on the BSWP website. If you quicker, you, there's only 50 of them. Right. So if you register quickly, then you get the red box. Well, that's all I'm saying. How to register quickly, but we can get the red box. <laughs> well, I'm wondering if I'm going to let the city. Do that, or if you have to do it individually. Let's find, let's, let's find out. I'll, I'll get with um, Miss Skinner, and I'll I'll get it. I know. Amanda said there's a bunch of good swag stuff in there. No, no, that's what I'm gonna do. Oh, that's what you want. Yeah, okay. <laughs> <laughs> do we have a comment? No, sir. I, I'll send that all out to y'all again, Chip. I just wanted. Forgive me for interrupting, Mr. Hamilton. My only answer is it uh, hazardous. Way stay on the 26th of March. Of March, yes, it is. It is from nine to three. Okay, on April 28th, we have tentative for another budget town hall meeting or a meeting. April 28th, tentative for a budget meeting. And then also, um, I want to go back to March, just to let you know, March 31st, we're also going to have Doug Sis um, retirement party. No, we're not going to let them go anywhere. We're just going to boot them out. <laughs> Yeah, she doesn't want to help. <laughs> Didn't get extended once already. And that's going to be at 3 p.m. at the Senior Center. Okay. The 31st of March. It's a Thursday. Busy, busy couple of months, folks. And, um, every Friday, I send y'all 30 days out on your city council calendar. So y'all will continue to get that. And then um, if we have a lot on the calendar, I'll bring two months in advance for y'all. We don't have the capability of sending that uh, like a meeting invite thing. No, but I am looking into an app right now and um, it's called Doodle. And I'm going to research that a little bit more to where we download it to our phone. And then I can send invites to all of y'all and it'll be in your calendar. So once I get that done and going, it'll probably alleviate a lot of these issues that we're having with the calendar. I've used Doodle before. It works pretty good. Yeah. So I, I'm currently looking into that and I will let y'all know once I have that. Okay. 
I'm sorry, what is that retirement for? The 31st of March at 3 p.m. at the Senior Center. Invitations hopefully will go out in these couple days. Everybody's everybody's smartphoning right now. <laughs> Let me know when, when you've done a smartphoning, we'll move on. All right, uh, so the next item, you're, you're done with that? Yes, sir. All right, uh, next item on the agenda is executive session. So I think we have time to initiate it. We'll see if we can get through it. If not, we will recess that and get to it at the end. So uh, if everyone would uh, please let us get to the next. Well, a good audience here. It is my pleasure to present uh, the properties that are uh, keep done in your beautiful. <laughs> oh, okay. There we go. All right, you apologize about that. So, uh, it gives me pleasure as uh, the uh, staff liaison for the Keep Duncanville Beautiful Board uh, to recognize these properties in the uh, city of Duncanville. We have five uh, board members that are dedicated to the process of uh, picking a uh, qualifying address in each district. And uh, in District 1, it was picked by Reese Edwards, and that is Roger and Brenda Hardy at 614 Oxford Drive. And if you are present uh, today, I would like at the end of this, the conclusion, if you all come down to the front um, uh, for the winners for a uh, group photo, if possible. District two is uh, selected by Mary Ann Taylor and the winner is Robert Lathan at 706 Walnut Street. District three is selected by Diane Dillard and that is uh, Joel, Maria and Jessica Perales at 614 East Cherry Street. District four selected by Alice Arnold is Terry and Miriam Sonak at 727 Valley Hill Road. And district five selected by Yachty Cruz is James and Catherine Crichton, 430 Longworth Boulevard. And so I'd just like to recognize, do we have any of those winners here in the audience tonight? All right. If, if you would, uh, wouldn't mind coming down here, we'd like to get a picture with you too. With you both there. That'd be great. <laughs> you must be the District 5 winner. Is that correct? Or one. Okay, I'm sorry. I, I just knew that his district was... The Great job. Thank you to all of these winners. Uh, we uh, appreciate their efforts to keep Duncanville beautiful. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Hamilton. Before I get started, I will announce to everyone present that it is the city policy that during election season, 
that these presentations and comments are not, I'm sorry, these are presented and recorded, but when we get to the citizen comment portion, those are not recorded and they are not broadcasted, but they are made public record in the minutes. So what I'm gonna be doing just in a couple of moments is being broadcasted and recorded, but when we go to citizen comments, the recordings will be turned off. That is our city policy. So next item on the agenda is a presentation of a champion of the city. In 2018, I began this process of recognizing individuals on our city that contribute to our continuity, to the community, and to the well-being of the entire society of the city of Duncanville. Over 20 individuals so far have been identified in that process and given that recognition as a champion of the city. It's individuals that have contributed to the arts, to education, to business, to athletics, and you just name it, it's the broad spectrum of what is a champion does not apply strictly to the process of athletics, which the city of champions, kind of where it goes back, how many eons, long before I was around. So the champion of the city is recognized by me of someone who has contributed a great deal of their life to what goes on in our city. And tonight, I'm going to recognize Dr. Ginger Hertenstein Conley. How are you, Chris? You're Ginger. Who, what's your name? Ginger. <laughs> <laughs> so I wanted to go ahead and read the item that I have prepared to recognize Ginger. Dr. Ginger Hertenstein Conley is pastor of First Presbyterian Church in Duncanville. She has pastored there for 14 years. Not only is she a spiritual leader in our community, organizing citywide prayers and multi-church holiday events, she has a heart for the city. From 2013 to 2016, she organized festivals with themes to create an attitude of caring. These festivals raised over $235,000 for the Duncanville Outreach Ministry, on whose board of directors she continues to serve. Dr. Hertenstein Conley also conducted community conversations to bind citizens together. These spiritual-based conversations focused on unity, race relations, and faith. In 2018, she organized a community choir, which was selected to perform a Christmas event at Carnegie Hall in New York City. Widespread contributions from the Duncanville community allowed for the choir members to participate in this extraordinary opportunity. Dr. Hertenstein Conley was Woman of the Year for the Duncanville Chamber of Commerce in 2018 and is presently the 2022 Chairperson of the Chamber Board of Directors. With March being Women's History Month, it is fitting to recognize a woman who does so much for our city. Dr. Hertenstein Conley is hereby recognized as a champion of the city, as mayor of the city of Duncanville. I ask our residents to join me, congratulating her on this memorable occasion. Along with that is a medallion you can use that to hold the door open or hold all the papers on your desk. Ginger would like to say a few words. First of all, thank you so much for the recognition. I appreciate that. And it's been a pleasure and a joy being in Duncanville, being a part of Duncanville. It's a great city. The thing that is so fun, it's talented and then we're diverse and our diversity really is our greatest strength. And so as we come together, we realize that talent, and that's one reason we got invited to Carnegie Hall. And the city supported that. We took some high school students. And so there's been a lot of participation in a lot of areas because we've got citizens that care and citizens that want to get involved. So it's been so much fun to just learn and get to know people and come together and do things that feel good, that feel like we have neighbors that care. So thank you so much. And if you belong to a church, your mission as a church is to get outside those walls and bless your city. So that's my charge to you tonight. 
Thank you for preaching, Pastor Ginger. <laughs> Let's take some pictures. March is also Women's History Month, and in recognition of that, I'm going to read a proclamation, and I would like to ask Mrs. Pat Weaver to come forward to accept this proclamation on behalf of all the women in our city. Pat, if you don't know her, is a ceramics instructor at the Senior Center. She is a leader of CERT, which is Community Emergency Response Team, and very, very active in, in many, many parts of our city. So, whereas March is Women's History Month, which commemorates and encourages the study, observance, and celebration of the vital role of women's American history. Women's History Month has been observed annually during the month of March in the United States since 1987. Throughout our history, women have influenced every facet of American life and culture. Women have been pioneers in the fields of science, medicine, engineering, education, finance, arts, journalism, business, government, and more. In 2022, Women's History theme is providing healing, promoting hope is both a tribute to the ceaseless work of caregivers and frontline workers during this ongoing pandemic, and also a recognition of the thousands of ways that women of all cultures have provided both healing and hope throughout history. During the month of March, we celebrate the contributions women have made to our country, to states, regions, and cities, and recognize the outstanding achievements women have made over the course of American history. Therefore, I, Barry Gordon, Mayor of the City of Duncanville, do hereby proclaim March 22 as Women's History Month, and I call upon all Duncanville residents to observe this month and celebrate women with appropriate programs, ceremonies, and activities. Pat, it is my honor to present this proclamation to you. This is truly an honor. I do what I do for the city because I love it. If there's any volunteering that anyone can do, get out and do it. It's the way to treat your city. Things that you can possibly do and you don't even think you can do, you can do it. Just get out and do it. So it's not just me as a woman, it's everyone. Please get out and just do what you can do to honor your city and your fellow people. Thank you. Thank you, Pat. As I mentioned earlier, uh, we are going to cease recording and cease broadcasting during the citizen comment period. City Secretary, please let me know if that's been accomplished.
four on our agenda. This is the consent agenda. City Secretary, please read the consent items. Item 4A, consider the minutes for February 1st, 2022 City Council regular meeting, the February 15th, 2022 City Council regular meeting, and the February 21st, 22 special City Council meeting. 4B, consider a resolution to enter into a joint agree election agreement and election services contract between Dallas County and other jurisdictions holding election on May 7, 2022 to be administered by the Dallas County Elections Administrator in accordance with subchapter D of chapter 31 and chapter 271 of the Texas Election Code. 4C, consider a resolution appointing election judges for the city of Duncanville and Dallas County for the May 7, 2022 general election and authorizing the city secretary to approve on behalf of the city of Duncanville any changes in the list of recommended election judges, which may become necessary because of the inability to serve of any of the persons named in Exhibit A. 4D, consider a resolution authorizing approval of a facade and paint incentive grant by the Duncanville Community and Economic Development Corporation, DCEDC, to Sarah R. Mitchell of Mitchell Commercial Investments, LLC, in the amount of $14,800 for a building located at 1307 South Alexander Avenue, Duncanville, Texas, 75137. Thank you, City Secretary. Chair Lentini, motion to approve. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to approve. Motion to approve by Mr. Mac Burnett, second by Mr. Vera Cruz. Please vote. Consent items passed unanimously. Thank you. Moving on to item number five, items for individual consideration, 5A. Consider a resolution adopting the city council vision statement and establishing the strategic pillars or priorities of the city council. Budget administrator, Ms. Odie, present the item. Thank you. Well, good evening, Mayor and Council. So the item before you for consideration is the approval of the vision statement and strategic pillars. So to recap, how did we get here? Um, at the, your November retreat, um, it was determined through our uh, discussions that the city does not have a vision statement. The vision statement is the ideal state of who we are, who we want to be. And so at this retreat, each of you, um, went through exercises to draft what our vision statement should be. So after multiple iterations, the final draft came to be Duncanville, a city of champions, is a safe, vibrant, diverse community committed to excellence in education, business, and good governance. Additionally, um, at the Monday, last Monday, we met again to revisit the retreat and to revisit our strategic pillars. As you may remember, we adopted strategic pillars back in 2019. But to capture the diverse needs and focus areas, the um, revision pillars that we propose, that are proposed are reimagine high quality of life. That means develop, maintain, and encourage safe, attractive, viable family-oriented neighborhoods that embrace diversity and pride, promoting economic vitality. The second one, emphasize government accountability, customer service, efficiency, and process improvement. That is described as develop a high-performing organization that encourages innovation, transparency, and collaboration while delivering exceptional customer service. Number three, promote innovative ideas for development and redevelopment. That means pursue a diverse and robust economy through various business, housing, and employment opportunities that encourage forward thinking community and economic development. The fourth one, develop infrastructure improvement strategy. So that's to ensure the viability and adaptability of the city's infrastructure facilities and transportation network through thoughtful financial and long-term planning. And last, advance marketing strategy of the city and community engagement plan. This would be strengthen communication and engagement within the community while championing the city of Duncanville regionally, nationally, and internationally. The pillars are what gets us to our vision. These are the milestones that we will work towards and the things that we do, um, these are the priorities. So, any questions? 
comment that we want to commend you and the entire city staff and especially city manager Aretha Farrell Benavides for this initiative to take on a different perspective on the mission statement and the individual business plans that are being programmed through the individual directorates at the executive level. We know that there's a lot of work that's gone into this, simply looking at the manner in which these comments have been made, the language, uh, they're not verbose, they're succinct, they're tight, they bring together a perfect vision. And if you look at the vision statement, go back to the vision statement. There it is. Duncanville, a city of champions, is a safe, vibrant, diverse community committed to excellence in education, business, and good governance. I personally commend you as our chief innovative officer, I guess, or innovation officer, as it's been newly established, and to uh, our city manager, Aretha uh, Farrell Benavides, and the entire staff for a detailed look at how to put this together because what this forms for us as you said are pillars you know if you coming from a business world an economic business world they always call it about the three-legged stool mm -hmm. uh, we have a five-legged stool if any one of those legs on that stool begin to fail we will topple but i don't believe as you have written them go to the next slide go to 35 again those five pillars serve to support the economic, the viability and the transparency of the entire city. I personally thank you for the work that's been put into this and for the collaboration between us and city council and to work spending the time in two different retreat times that we have spent putting this time together. Uh, it is time well spent and extremely worthwhile. Those are my comments and I would encourage uh, council to approve. Any other comments by council, please? Seeing none, Chair uh, Mr. McBurnett. Motion to approve. Thank motion. you for the comments. We have a motion to approve by Mr. McBurnett, second by Mayor Pro Tem, Mr. Harvey. Please vote. There you go. Thank you. Approved unanimously. You and once again, our extreme and outstanding venture and work. Item 5B, consider an ordinance amending Chapter 1, General Provisions, Division 1, General Code Construction, Section 1-5, General Penalty for Violation of Code, Continuing Violations by adding a new Section 1-5A, Enforcement of the Code of Ordinance to authorize and establish regulations for the enforcement of the Municipal Code of Ordinances and other codes and ordinance of the city, authorizing any designated code enforcement officer, inspector, or animal control officer of the city to issue citations for violations of the municipal, municipal code, ordinances, and other codes and ordinances of the city. Mr. Jeremy Tennant, our neighborhood services manager, floor is yours, sir. Honorable Mayor, Council, just wanna give you a brief description about the codes of ordinances for the city of uh, Duncanville. Uh, basically, this is a request, as you stated, to basically allow the writing, um, the writing of citations as we currently do in the city. City staff has begun a task of uh, reviewing the city, uh, Duncanville's ordinances, processes and procedures, and practices. Staff is uh, looking to ensure that there is no conflict through this research, uh, to ensure that they're within the state of Texas and the statutes and clarify any potential ambiguous and conflicting language um, as it relates to code enforcement. The primary goal is to ensure that our um, current ordinance is comprehensive and inclusive of all current practices authorized within the state of Texas uh, regarding code enforcement. Uh, current practices in code involve the writing of citations by our enforcement and inspection entities for all violations. The issuance of citations have been explicitly um, authorized for certain violations, i.e. graffiti and also signs. However, there are many core code um, areas that are not specifically detailed in our ordinance. Uh, this request, in essence, will allow for us to update the current municipal codes uh, of ordinances to be in compliance with our current practices. And it also validate the city's administration's ability to authorize license neighborhood service officers, health inspectors, and animal, animal um, um, control officers to continue issuing citations for all code and health-related violations within the city's code of ordinances. Do you have any questions for me? Uh, yes, just one comment, and then Mr. Contreras. Uh, city Council, we do know that uh, this is not the first time we've seen this. this yes. is, we have reviewed this, and it was extensively reviewed by a city attorney for legality of other individuals to issue citations. 
Uh, so this is bringing it all together and understanding how this is going to be proper and of course this Texas code. And so first, Mr. Contreras and Mr. Mac Burnett, Mr. Contreras. Uh, I've asked this question before, but since this is our final run at this, I want to ask again. I want to be clear that the use of the word inspector covers our cross connection manager and our water and wastewater superintendent to also be able to write citations. It, it does because uh, state law authorizes that. So. Okay, thank you. Mr. McBurnett. And my question went around along the same line, but basically, uh, I guess I'm going to ask the question from Mr. Tennant is that. Now the practices we've done have been, or the practices we've done have still been what we should be doing, right? There's yes, no sir. We're just caught applying. Okay. Thank you. Uh, see no further comments. Uh, I would chair will entertain a motion to approve. Motion to approve, Mayor. Motion to approve, Mr. Mac Burnett. Second. Second. By Mr. Cooks. Council, please vote. Unanimously approved. Thank you. Item 5C is taking any necessary action as a result of executive session. There is no action to be taken as a result of executive session. That includes, that concludes item five on our agenda. Moving to item six, staff and board reports. Receive the Public Works Department quarterly report. Mr. Ramey. Colonel Ramey. Hua. Uh, good evening. <clears throat> good evening, Mayor and Council. Again, I'm Greg Ramey. I'm the uh, Managing Director of Public Works here to talk to give you a quarterly update. Um, so first, we'll look at uh, the personnel. We've had um, some good updates from Building Inspections and Engineering Division. Uh, our building official uh, passed all his, uh, became a certified building official. Uh, it took us a little bit longer than we wanted, but it was a we had a lot of delays due to COVID and getting registrations and everything else. So he's um, uh, achieved his uh, certified building official credentials. Um, engineering division added a second uh, engineer to that division. He's a EIT, he joined us on Monday, but that will help us in the engineering department with uh, project management, floodplain management, uh, civil engineer, technical reviews as part of uh, new developments, um, and as far as our MS4 and just uh, helping that with all our CIP projects that we've got in, in the city. Uh, may I interrupt? Just a quick question, Mr. Ramey. As an EIT, does he have an engineering degree or he's pursuing that degree as he's an EIT? Uh, no, EIT follows uh, graduation with your degree. So he okay. uh, graduated four years ago and then uh, EIT um, certification is uh, prerequisite for pursuing professional engineering license. PE, okay, great, thank you yes, very sir. much, sorry. Um, so we, uh, in utilities division, sorry, I'm moving this little tag. Uh, we, <clears throat> we had uh, two new employees join the utility division. Uh, with that said, as you see there, we still have four vacancies. So out of a, a total division strength of 20, we're at 75% strength. And again, these are our field personnel. And then in streets division, um, we still have six vacancies in that uh, department out of it, again, another 18. Um, so we've uh, had to um, mothball one crew um, just be, because we don't have the manpower right now. Uh, so we're working with HR and trying to see what we can do to um, get, get more recruitment and retention within our, our field maintenance uh, divisions. Mr. Koontz, did you have a, a question what, where we're at right now? Uh, yes, sir. Thank you, Mayor. Yes, sir. Uh, the Is that just due to lack of applicants, the vacancies? Because they've been vacant for a while, right? They have. Um, it, it is a lot of uh, lack of applicants. Uh, we have a lot of... Um, so there is a, a, a lack of applicants in general, and then the folks that we're interested in, we have a lack of of appearance following making a point uh, interviews um, and then um, and then the conversion rate once we um, offer their salaries um, is very very poor okay. thank you 
Um, looking into engineering, recent accomplishments. Um, as everybody knows, Daniel Dale Road is ongoing. Uh, we've been really doing a lot of work on the westbound lanes. Um, and then again, here's just more pictures of uh, Daniel Dale Road and the efforts to get the westbound lanes. Once they are done, we'll close. We'll open them up for traffic and then the eastbound lanes will be closed. Um, and again, the project completion date is uh, December of this year. Uh, we're finishing uh, Green Tree Road. I know that's one that, um, I know for you, Mayor, you, you live in that area, um, but we're, we're finishing that up. Here's some pictures of that water, uh, waste, uh, water wastewater line um, reap replacement project. And we're just in the site restoration phase now. Again, that was a $1.1 million construction job. Um, we've still got two other phases in that neighborhood that will be coming in the in the next few fiscal years. Hey, excuse me, uh, Ramy, on your report. I'm, yes, I know, I'm, I'm very visual and maybe, maybe I'm the only, only one, but back to that Wintergreen, uh, back to that Daniel Dale project, would you go back for just a second? There you go. And I think I've mentioned this before. Is there any way to have a visual picture of the final outcome of what that project is going to look like upon completion? I think as citizens uh, are inconvenienced about driving down that road for construction, if they could physically see the picture of how it's going to look at the end, uh, that may help and help me yes. as well. As a yes, reminder. sir. Yes, sir. I'm, uh, I'll work with, I know we provided one for, um, to Alex Hamby that was incorporated in the state of the city, uh, which was sort of an aerial um, rendering that incorporated um, the landscape elements uh, that were sort of at the um, two uh, at Main Street at 67, as well as the, uh, the landscape monument, the new gateway monument at that location. As you know, we uh, as part of this job, the old land, the old uh, Duncanville Monument um, on the 67 side was was removed for as we redid the payment, and so we're putting in a new gateway monument um, that mimics the monuments that um, we're putting on uh, US 67. Yeah, I did see the, the I did see the the the, the uh, what you're speaking of. However, it still was not as clear. Uh, that I'm, I guess I'm just thinking of a picture, picture that I don't have to try to figure out what's what. So okay. I'll ask city manager I, I, if I she could come up with um, something. But we can get with the engineers to get that together. I'd love to have that posted up in the lobby of the upper city hall. When when a, a citizen are asking about that, we can refer them to city hall or, or continue to have it post where it could, they can really see the, that visual. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so one of the other um, events that we wanted to highlight during this last quarter was winter storm land and support. Uh, so during that um, winter storm, uh, the utility crews and the street crews worked 12 hour shifts to, um, you know, again, keep this road sanded uh, for mobility, uh, at least along the ar arterials and supporting uh, emergency operations by the police and fire departments. Um, you see the picture here of one of our, our sanding trucks um, that the city owns, or it's one of our dump trucks with a sanding attachment in the back of it. Um, and then, of course, the utilities division was on hand just monitoring all of our water systems, again, making sure that everything is, is running. Um, and then we had a, a smaller storm uh, at the end of February, 23 to 25, um, where in that particular case, it was just the street crews and uh, some mechanics that work the 12 hour shifts to um, take care of everything during that storm. Uh, we can, we're continuing with the uh, sidewalk um, repair projects. Um, this has been, I know that for a lot of the long-term council, but for the newer council members, this is something that we've been uh, working on for several years now. We started um, over in West, West Park, or Flame, e Flame East, over off of uh, Fane um, with our first projects and we've been jumping neighborhood by neighborhood. Uh, but something I've noticed as I've been driving around is our arterial roads also need uh, some attention. And so what I've directed my street department is we're gonna finish Marybrook Park and then we're gonna go to Wheatland Road. Uh, you'll see the phases there. It's not just starting from the east and working west. We're trying to 
target where the most pedestrian traffic has been observed, uh, where we've, um, there's some, um, we know mobility uh, or vision impaired um, residents that, that use Wheatland. And so we wanna, that's sort of another reason why we pick that arterial to be first. Um, and then once we finish Wheatland, we'll go back into the neighborhoods as well, but this will take us a while. Um, we only have, you know, again, the one sidewalk, sidewalk crew. Yes, to make that'll be uh, complete. Do we have a, a a plan of when that we think that uh, sidewalks on on Wheatland all all over just all, the overall the overall plan for sidewalks. Um, we have not really looked um, in terms of the sidewalks. The sidewalk maintenance is one thing we just are bouncing all the way through the city, um, but we have not really. Uh, examined, you know, the to how to bring the rest of the sidewalks through the city yet. No, so, we're, so we're still trying to connect. We're trying to connect the sidewalks where if I wanted to walk around uh, most of the city, at some point would we would we be able to connect the connected um, building? That, that is the, the desired end state. Um, the uh, the challenge that we have, I mean, we've got to sort of, uh, again, that's one of the, the uh, infrastructure items that we've got to continue to scope and figure, figure out what we need to do to complete the, you know, where the sidewalks do not exist in the city. Um, but that hasn't been quantified uh, yet. Um, so we're still having to work on that. So. And, and remind me of funding of this. Is this funding through the, how we're funding this? So uh, we used to be funded um, every year out of the red light fund. Right. Um, but with the, the disillusion of that program, uh, the funding for sidewalks um, is the same funding that would, um, you know, it competes with funding for, you know, all the other general fund expenditures. And in my department, it competes with uh, road maintenance, mill and overlays, um, pavement re replacement, um, and all those other street maintenance programs that they sort of tend to compete with each other. I'm trying to recall the uh, I'm trying to recall the grants that we get for for, for sidewalks. What is that? Um, yes, sir. So every two years uh, through the county, we get uh, CDBG yeah, funding, mm -hmm. and usually what that um, equates to is a little over half of that money goes to support um, the expenses related to one neighborhood services officer for code enforcement in the CDBG areas. And that usually frees up between 80 and $100,000 every year, depending on what trick you know, comes down to us through, um, through the county, through HUD. Um, and so we do have a CDBG project that's uh, finished with the design and getting ready to go on the street. And that's the um, ADA ramps in Forest Hills. Um, and then after that, we'll have another sidewalk project subject to council's approval of the CDBG overall CDBG program um, somewhere else in a CDBG area. Okay. So city manager, at some point, can we perhaps look at what it will look like uh, a whole project of sidewalk around the whole city? Wouldn't it be beautiful one day that we could walk 11 point miles that we have in our city from sidewalk to sidewalk, but I know that's a long-term vision, but, uh, but if you will at least tell us how that will look at some point, uh, that will help us out. Uh, Mayor and council, what we will do is we're getting ready to kick off our budget process right now. And so what we will do is when we start to talk about some of the capital expenditures, we'll include that <coughs> as one of the long-term, but also to talk about what it looks like and maybe what a, uh, a plan would look toward doing that. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Coons, I see, do you have a comment, please? Yes, sir, thank you. Uh, so th this is my first time seeing this, and I'm, I'm glad to know that this, these projects are going on. I was just curious, uh, what kind of conditions warrant repairs? Uh, so what we're looking for in the neighborhoods as it relates to just your normal pavement sections or cracked pavement, um, or, you know, in a lot of areas, especially these, as you know, these, we've been working in the older parts of town. And so you get a lot of uneven pavement as a result of, you know, trees, roots. And that's really what we're looking at in, you know, if you're looking sort of along the fields, uh, something that we find that's very, very typical in a lot of our older neighborhoods is they have obsolete 
or non-existent um, barrier-free ramps, ADA ramps. And so a lot of these neighborhoods, they have nothing, they just have curb. Um, and so that's sort of what we're looking at in these neighborhoods, uh, convert, you know, updating the ADA ramps or you know, adding ramps where they were just old curb. And then just the pavement sections again that are cracked and otherwise um, non-passable. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mac, we're down. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Mr. Ramey, I, I want to commend your group and, and stuff. I mean, I, it's obvious you've had shortages and stuff like that, but this concrete crew has done a wonderful job and really done well. Uh, it's a it's a kind of hard, fast question, but how much do you really think or how? I know we've saved a lot of money by having our concrete crew. So any estimation on approximately how much? Oh, that um, so. yes. I know we ran these numbers when we first uh, introduced the concrete crew probably a few years ago. But I think, you know, I, I can certainly look that up and provide it to council. But off the top of my head, I think we were about 75% uh, um, versus the contract, maybe even more when we're looking at the ramps um and ramps are really expensive on the on the market um and then the sidewalks so we we do save a lot of money big picture with the crew um and, it, and they do awesome work and again they don't um they don't always go into these the sidewalks so we will have them you know break contact out of marybrook park um in response to um a, a you know a call somewhere else where um, and a good example, we, we got a call, we were in this area, we got a call, I think at Apollo in Wheatland, we had to go and do some work because, um, there was a water leak, but in that particular area, again, we have a, 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 a Duncanville resident who's uh, visually impaired and uses Wheatland. And so we were like, okay, we got to stop, go back, fix this sidewalk, get it back operable again, and then we'll go back or we'll get pulled from other missions. Um, elsewhere in the city where we need the concrete. And again, sometimes we pull them and they have to do road repairs too because of our manning. Uh, so just running through uh, some of the sanitation events that we've done the last quarter and then looking forward. Uh, so during uh, the holiday grease roundup, we collected 35 gallons of grease. Uh, and again, I'll just use this as a, as a public uh, announcement that again that we please please do not dump your grease down the drains because they end up in the sewer pipes and create a big mess and clogs and um, it does not help your neighbors so again if you've got a lot of grease store it come see us we'll help you we'll certainly take it we take it year round but we really focus on it during the holidays when everybody's frying turkeys and doing everything else um, but again, I'll just use that as an opportunity again to encourage people to not dump their grease down the sink. Um, just some upcoming events. Uh, Public Works will be uh, uh, manning a booth at the Flavor of Duncanville event uh, later this month. Uh, we'll be talking about uh, recycling, again, fat oil and grease, water conservation. Uh, another thing we talked about, the flushable wipes might go down your toilet, but that's as far as they go. Um, and so we really want to, you know, we usually try to encourage people to not flush the flushable wipes. Um, and we'll talk about um, protecting our storm sewers. Again, our municipal, uh, so we have municipal separate storm water system, which means when the, the storm water goes into the drain, it goes right into the creeks. And so it's coming upon all of us as a, as a community to do what we can to keep uh, pesticides, keep, mo you know, petroleum products to keep, you know, uh, trash and garbage out of off the streets and out of the drains so that we don't get them in our creeks. Excuse me. City Manager, is that Flavor of Duncanville boot, is that, I know we mentioned now twice that will be there. Are we paying for those boots? Is that, is that coming, Mary, as a part of our chamber membership, or do we have to pay for that separately? City Manager or City Secretary can answer that. <laughs> Each department pays for their own booth. And remind me of the cost. Two hundred and fifty dollars a booth. All right, thank you. Um, and then again, just some other programs. I know we hit them a little bit at the briefing session. Household hazardous waste collection is on March twenty sixth. 
And then again, we have Operation Clean Duncanville on April 9th. Um, another uh, product uh, performance indicator that we've uh, carried forward is um, our sanitation um, complaint rate. So this is all again tied to calls that um, Republic reports to us, as well as the calls that we directly receive at the service center. And the goal uh, that we have is less than 1% of our households um, make calls, have complaints, are not happy with the service. And, and as you see, our, our system is, is um, below the line, except for the two areas that you see highlighted. One was um, when we were recovering from URI and we, we you know, had uh, a lot of people calling about when the garbage trucks were coming, but you know, the, the roads were impassable. We did get a lot of um, calls. And then um, back in August, COVID really went through the Republic uh, workforce. And so they had a lot of, um, they had to pull all, a lot of their bulk and brush truck operators off to put them into the regular trucks. And it, that did receive, a, a, you know, generate a spike in, in complaints in August while they were um, having to adjust their manpower to cover a, the, a COVID spike in their, in their, uh, in their and, office. And, and I normally ask this question, so I'll ask it again. And that is the complaints we're receiving is that only from areas that they're calling into Republic? Or are we also tracking when people call into the city? Yes, sir. So if you look um, on the chart here, the uh, orange line reflects the um, calls that the city receives. And the blue line reflected the calls reported to us by the Republic call center. And so the gray line is what we're measuring above the 1%, which is a sum of those two, those two numbers. Okay. And then another performance indicator related to how um, uh, Republic is doing our, our, our solid waste collection contractor has to do with how well we are staying on schedule with bulk and brush collection. So again, we're supposed to go north of the city, south of the city, alternating weeks, uh, every, twice, a, twice a month. And so they, and they tell us every, every day where they're at and how they're doing. And so again, as you see, um, where we have the, the, the dips, again, we're tied to URI where they got behind on bulk and brush. And so they got behind schedule. And then again, they got behind schedule in August during their COVID, uh, bout with COVID um, as they had to pull bulk and brush truck operators off to drive the normal garbage trucks. But other than that, they maintained their bulk and brush collection schedule through December. And uh, any questions from council? Thank you, Colonel Ramey, Mr. Ramey. No, no question. I do want to thank you very much for continuing to add that if that uh, chart about complaints. I know I've been asking that for some time and you've been delivering every time. So thank yes, you for sir. bringing thank that you, up. Sir. Appreciate it. And my final comment in terms of the, the sidewalks, it improves the walkability of the city, which we are focused on doing as well. Thank you very much. That concludes our meet up. Hey, Mayor, I'm sorry. It's not a comment for Ramey, but the Duncanville Panthers did win the basketball game tonight. They beat the soda. Okay. Thank you very much. That concludes our city council meeting for March 1st of 2022. Timestamp is 924. Thank you. <laughs>